right, well, welcome back to our series that we've been calling Relationship Goals. And if you've been with us over the last handful of weeks, we've been talking about this idea that each and every one of us have desires on the inside for the relationships around us. Now, maybe that's in friendships, that's peer relationships at work, But that's also our intimate relationships, our relationships of boyfriend and girlfriend and husband and wife. We all have this picture of relationship. And we all, for the most part, want to be in some form of romantic relationship. In fact, most people at some point in their life, they're going to fall in love. It seems like it. all it takes is like a heartbeat, like a a pulse. If you've got blood flowing through your veins, at some point you fall in love. You enter into relationship. And we have this picture, these relationship goals of what happily ever after is going to look like, what it should be, what it ought to be, the potential that it could become. We have these relationship goals, but It doesn't take very long before you realize what I realize is relationships are complicated. (laughs) This thing is tough work. (laughs) It doesn't take us long before we jump into the relationship and we, we begin asking like, what happened to the fairy tale? What happened to Happily Ever After? And so our simple goal throughout this series has been to help you to win in relationships. <laughs> and typically, as we're setting this up and we're getting ready to unpack the next part of a series like what we are today, like you probably don't know this, but I spend a lot of like creative energy trying to come up with like how to build a bridge to this introduction and connect you to an idea in a way that engages you. And, and I started to do that with this one. And here's what I quickly realized is for this topic, I I don't need a big hook. For this topic, all I need is one word. In fact, all I need is three letters. All I need to do is just put the word on screen and, well, there's your hook. (laughs) It's amazing how even the dude who normally like sits in the back and like nods off and has fallen asleep by this point in the sermon, it's like, no, not today, bro. I'm, oh, (laughs) what's he going to say next? There's something about this topic, this idea, and all of us approach it like from different places of of maturity on the inside. (laughs) Some of you are middle schoolers, like genuinely middle schooler, and you're like, (laughs) he said, he said sex. (laughs) And then some of you, like, like the moms in the room, you're like pinching your booty cheeks and you're like, oh my goodness. (laughs) What's he going to say next? Especially like if you've got a kid in the room. (laughs) And then some, like the dads who are in the room, well, that's just the middle schooler all over again, isn't it? (laughs) He said, babe, he's talking about sex. We all have these different relationships, these ideas, this this interest in sex. And so we're going to, let's talk about sex, baby. We're going to talk about doing it. We're going to talk about doing it God's way. And this is why my wife said, I am not coming up there with you this week. (laughs) I refuse. Uh, So let's dig into this for just a second. And as I've said, we're we're going to keep it classy, okay? So you've been forewarned. Those of you who are on the internet, this is your last chance. You can click off now if your little ones are there watching. Look, we're going to have a conversation that culture is already talking about all the time, but we don't really talk about it in the church because it feels a little bit taboo and like, are you even allowed to say that in church? I mean, come on. And so we have these places inside of relationship and and what I want you to see as we begin to unpack this and unbox it and talk about sex, it's just for a few different people. If you're a youth in this room, man, if I could just have your attention for like 20 minutes or so, what we're gonna look at will change everything for you It'll protect you from some of the junk that happened in my life. Some of you who are single and maybe you're exploring, you're in dating relationships and you're like, you're kind of venturing right up next to the line. Some of the stuff we're going to talk about today is going to help you a lot. And then married folks, what I need you to see is this thing that God has gifted us with through sex. 
Oh my goodness, this is a game changer for your relationships, but oftentimes it's misunderstood, it's misused, and sometimes even abused. And so when we begin talking about sex, like you don't really need a guy like me to come up here and educate you like on the anatomy. Sorry, boys. This is a spiritual lesson. We don't even have graphics for you today. You're welcome. <laughs> but here's what you already see. Here's what you already know, especially when it comes to sex, is it's pervasive. It's like we have a sex-saturated society. Everywhere you go, everywhere you turn, everywhere you look, you turn on your TV, you turn on Netflix, you pick out a movie, and you can't even get a movie to the tops of the box office unless you insert certain scenes. If you are wanting to sell something and you're struggling to sell it, what do you do? You sexify it. You can't sell a magazine, you will put some bathing suits on the front. You can't sell a car, put a hot girl in the driver's seat. We see this pervasive idea of sex everywhere around us and it's being sold to us as an idea. And as we look at what culture is doing and the pervasiveness of the culture around us, what we quickly realize is that these conversations are taking place everywhere from the boardroom, at business meetings, to the locker rooms. Fellas, some of the conversations that would take place behind those closed doors. This is pervasive, this conversation around sex. And one of the things that we see is, is pervasive perversion. Because what we see, the way that sex is portrayed, the picture that we get, what culture shows us, is not what it actually is intended to be. We have this pervasive perversion. And sex, when we talk about relationship goals, I mean, we have a picture, we have desire, on the inside of us, and God actually created something to bring us together, but one of the things that happens on the inside of culture is now what was meant to be good is actually bringing destruction. Did you know that sex is actually one of the leading causes of divorce? Isn't that interesting? That this thing that's supposed to bring and unite is actually, when misused and abused, when it's a perversion, when it's anything but the way that God designed it to be. And so here's what I wanna do is I I wanna just dig in for a few minutes and we're gonna look at scripture and I, I wanna help you with God's guide to winning at sex. And keeping in mind youth, singles, and married, okay? And so let's talk about this for just a minute. And maybe like you, and maybe you were like me, and, and when I grew up outside of the church and, and I would hear the church's position, it was always as if God was almost like anti-sex. It was almost as if that was like icky and sticky and yucky and therefore you didn't, it, it was this position and, and, and sometimes this would become the idea, the framework for which we would see even God's view and his perspective on sex itself. But what we missed though, and probably not you because you're, you're bright, is that God was actually, he's the author, he's the originator, he's actually one who designed sex, that God himself created sex. God invented it. He's not anti-sex, he's pro-sex. That's weird, isn't it? God's pro-sex. Think about this for just a second, okay? All right, so let's just go back, and you're familiar with this. Let's go back to the beginning, like like back in Genesis, and let's go back to the creation account, and you remember this thing, this moment, and we refer to it sometimes here at the church. This is the creation story, and, and so God is, he's creating, he's speaking everything into existence, and he creates the, the plants, he creates the animals, he creates the sky, the land, and then he creates mankind, and as he sees everything, you remember what he said. He sees it and he says, this is not just good, but very good. 
This is very good. He sees this creation. He describes what's going on, and he says it is very good, and then something unexpected happens, something that we talk about in our design for relationship. Here's what he says. He says, I see something that is not very good. It's actually not good. Here's what he says. He says, the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone, and I'm going to make a helper that is suitable for him. Now, follow with me for a second. I want you to just imagine. So Adam has been in like the creation account. He has seen it all from the garden's perspective. He's seen all the elephants and giraffes, and he's seen the wildlife and the trees and the birds and the sea animals. He's seen all of these things, and there's still something that is not satisfied on the inside of him. And God sees it too. And he says, boy, I'm about to help you. God, well, what you got in mind? And God pulls like a trust me bro on him for a minute. And he's like, you just go take a nap, dude. <laughs> I'm about to blow your mind. <laughs> he, he sends Adam into this deep sleep. And you know the creation account. Here's what happens as a result of it. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib that he had taken out of him. And you can see why he was in a deep sleep. I mean, he's making out of a rib. He puts him to sleep. He takes this woman. He creates this woman out of him. And then the man said, and I just imagine this moment. And I just imagine because he, was, he had been feeling alone and something wasn't the way that it was supposed to be, I imagined this scene and, and God's, hey, Adam, hey, Adam, wait, wait, wake up. I, I brought you something. I, I brought you a blessing, Adam. You need to wake up. You need to see this. And watch this verse. This, this is what we see. Adam and his wife were, oh, yeah. So Adam wakes up and he's, he's clearing the sleep from his eyes and he's like, whoa, would you look at that? 36, 24, 36, <laughs> only if you five, three. <laughs> So I just imagine, right? And so God creates Adam. There's something that's missing on the inside of him. He says, oh boy, you think that looks good? You haven't experienced anything yet. Just wait and watch what happens next. I just imagine he's like, that, my God, is good. That is good. And God leans in and here's what he says. And watch this. He says, you think what you see is good. Watch what happens next. Here's what he says. He says, and this is why a man leaves his father and his mother, and he's what? He's united to one wa his wife, and then they become boom, chicka, bow, bow. Here's where the magic begins to happen. This is, this is where Adam and Eve, they have this moment. They, they pull away and... Look, I don't mean to be graphic. Maybe they go find a bush. They have their area. They get away from the giraffes, okay? Because that would not be... Adam and Eve, they're going to unite their lives together. I'm not making light. But do you see behind this whole thing that God is the author, that he's the creator, that he's not anti, he's actually for, and that he put something in motion, that he planted something on the inside, and it would only come to fruition, to fulfillment. It would only be fulfilled through this one certain channel through sex through two becoming one that God was putting something in motion and so what we see is that God is not anti-sex that we actually see that sex is God's gift sex is God's gift <laughs> now when I got married there were many people who came to my wedding and they brought me gifts some of people brought us a toaster. Somebody brought us one of those vacuums, those high-end Dyson vacuums. But nobody, nobody brought me a gift like God's gift. It became this wedding present. Sex is God's gift to us. And one of the things that we see on the inside of relationship, and you need to understand this, you need to see it in you don't need me to articulate it because you already know it's there, is that you were designed with desires on the inside of you that were God-given, that are rolling around on the inside. Sometimes there's tension on how we navigate them. What do I do with them? But they can only be fulfilled in. And this is what I want to show you. 
is doing it God's way? What does it look like for us to follow God's pattern? We were designed with these desires. Now, every wife in here, this is where you get the opportunity to elbow your husbands because every man can make a sex joke about anything. Let your wife be cooking tacos. or oh, I'll give you some beef for those tacos. One of the things that happens is a man's brain... Oh, look, a squirrel. I will get emails. One of the things that happens is that our brain is fixated. It's, it's stuck on. It's in these places of desire. <laughs> What's it said statistically that a men, are, or men are thinking about sex multiple times a minute? You might think something is wrong with you. God put it there. I want to help you to understand something. Those of you, and I, I don't mean to be silly, but some, some of you, you know where you first start to experience these desires? Some of you who are youth in the room right now, you're, you're actually kind of navigating this. And it's weird. It's an awkward phase. I don't know if you remember puberty. <laughs> Your body's going through all of these changes and these emotions and these hormones. And now you're trying to figure out how to navigate these new desires that you have on the inside of you that you don't even understand yet. You're still trying to find answers to. That's a natural thing. What I want you to hear is that God put desires on the inside of us, but then he gives a specific framework and outlet for how those desires are to be played out. And when it's not, it becomes dangerous. And so what you need to see is we're designed with these desires and God gives us these God gives us this framework. And so let me just show you these few pieces of, of how God designed sex and what it looks like for us and why it matters so much, okay? And so here's what you should see. Uh, sex is sacred. It, one of the things that's happening in, type of, in culture is sex is treated as common, is treated as everyday. And this idea that of something that should be preserved and reserved is lost. But when God created sex, he, he gave us a framework for it, and it becomes sacred. So this is why we see right here when it says in Genesis, as we've read, that the two would become one flesh, husband, wife. Just for clarification purposes, I know in today's time, this can be a little bit confusing. When God created sex, he intentionally designed it, not just for man and woman, he designed it within the framework within the container of, to be held within, not to be outside of the marriage. And so he creates it that the two, the husband shall leave his wife and the two shall become one flesh. And here's what you need to know. And sometimes we miss this, especially like if you're single and you're dating, it's like, we think it's, it's about maturity. Sex isn't about maturity, it's about marriage. Sex isn't for mature people, it's for married people. Just because you've got a job and you can pay your bills, you drive your own car, you moved out of your mama's basement finally, that does not mean, okay, now we can do the deed. What you need to know, what you need to understand is that God has designed sex in such a way that there's a container, that there are boundaries. It needs to exist only within. And for us, is it's not just about mature, it's about being inside of married relationship. That there's something so special about this act, and I'm going to show you why, that God preserves it and protects it that it can only be as God intended it to be within this framework of relationship. And so I'm just going to say it like it is. You may hear in your schools, single people, when I was growing up, do you know what they said? Safe sex. Safe sex. Just slap a condom on that thing and you'll be good to go. Safe sex. What I need you to understand is there is no safe sex outside of marriage relationship with God. This physical act that you need to understand, it's so important. It's so critical for your relationship goals that there is no other appropriate place for it to play out except for within your marriage relationship. There is no safe sex outside of marriage. And so if God is... 
the author of sex and God's pro-sex? Why do we have these boundaries? Why is there this do this, don't do that, behave this way, stop doing that? It seems like sexual sin is one of those things that just, it shows up in the Bible all the time. Scripture's just always talking about it. Why all the rules if God has blessed it? And so we see these warning labels within Scripture. Let me just show you. One of the things that you should understand is that when we begin to treat sex as some casual thing that we can jump in and out of bed sheets, then we put ourselves in a place of danger. Sex, while it is a gift, it is also highly explosive. It is also highly dangerous. And this is why God puts it within the container of the marriage relationship. Watch what he says here as this just this place of warning. Can a man scoop fire into his lap without his clothes being burned? Can a man walk on hot coals without his feet being scorched? So is he who sleeps with another man's wife. No one touches her will go unpunished. What he's painting the picture is both and. It's both sides of this equation. One is that there's no way that you can play with sex and not get burned. It's dangerous, it's explosive. You may think, hey, we're just fooling around. It's just you know, heavy petting. You may think that that's okay, but what you're doing is playing with fire and you are just moments away from being burned up. Can a man walk on hot coals? Can I continue to press the envelope to see how far I can get, how close to the line? Well, we didn't go all the way, but we're doing everything else. How far can I go? This becomes the questions that we take into our relationship. And God warns us, look, this thing is meant to be within a special kind of relationship. And oftentimes it ends up getting, getting used, abused, treated the wrong way, handled the wrong way. And so we see that sex is supposed to be inside a relationship and and I've told you this next point before. The sex is, sex is sticky. Sex is sticky. What I need you to see, and this, is, this might be one of the most important things for you to see. And so Mark, he's quoting back to the book of Genesis. And he's going to go all the way back to what we just read a moment ago. And he's saying, this is the reason. He's going to leave his father and his mother. They're going to be united in one flesh. And, and now they're no longer what? They're no longer two, but they're one flesh. Now watch this next verse. Here's what he says. Therefore, what does it say? Come on, help me out. Yeah, what God has joined together, let no man separate. Can I just show you this for just a second? Is that you are designed to be one with one. You're not designed to be one with multiple ones. You're designed to be one with one. This is part of God's like, have you ever thought about this? It's like, there's one God, one man, one woman, one marriage, one sex partner. It's one flesh for one lifetime. This is God's design for what sex would look like. And two would become one flesh. And sex is sticky in the sense of your lives are joined together. And according to scripture, let no man, let no man let no man separate them because sex is sticky. It's meant to be something that brings your lives and bonds them together. When two become one, young people, do not miss this. When two become one, it is not just a physical act of two parts joining together like puzzle pieces. It's more than physical. It's deeply emotional. It is profoundly spiritual. And so for us, when we see that two become one, there's this connection, there's this idea between sex and the soul. When we look at scripture and it talks about sexual sin and the dangers and the destructions that come, we see that sex is sticky, that somehow at the soulish level, it's more than what's just happening here on the physical. Something's happening deeply in the emotional, in the spiritual, and the physical. And so sex becomes sticky. Let me show you this, okay? Now, we would identify this from Scripture, and we would see that God would say that what man has joined together, let no man, what God has joined together, let no man separate. Sex is sticky. Now, psychology actually will reinforce this same idea 
and they'll actually say it this way, that sex is, it's, it's like a glue. It's literally called, you can Google it yourself. It's sex glue. And here's what happens, okay? Just go with me. Try not to be crass. Here's what happens. It's because God has designed your, wired you to turn towards one another, to be attracted towards one another. There are things that happen when your engine gets going, when you see something or the emotion, now your engine's revved up. You're following me. Okay, don't look at me like I'm... When the engine gets revved up and you're ready to go, something is happening. God has wired you in such a way that that there are actually chemical compounds within your body, within your brain, within your anatomy, within your physiology. Your body begins to respond. It begins to change. It begins to prepare itself. And one of the things that's happening is God has designed this in such a way when two are ready to become one and there's something that happens. When we enter into a physical act with one another and that comes towards climax, yes, in church, (laughs) there's something that happens. Endorphins and serotonins and things that are firing inside of our brains and our synapses. But you see something. Sex is actually said to be as addictive as a drug, Like, like cocaine that there's something inside of your body that these serotonins, that these endorphins, that this response mechanism that you have, and that when you reach a place of pleasure within you, your brain is this hardwiring to the thing that brought you that pleasure. Let me help you to understand this a little bit further, okay? You have things that are on the inside of your brain and God put them there so that when your body responds and you reach a place of pleasure together, it's meant to send something, to fire it inside of your brain, to continue to bring you back to the marriage bed. God actually created sex for you with inside of relationships that my wife or my thoughts and my wife's thoughts turn back towards one another that we literally become addicted to each other. We turn back to each other. God put these chemical compounds on the inside of our body that it turns us back. Sex is sticky. And God wires us this way. And it's meant to be, not just for any old person, it's meant to be with one husband, wife, to point each other, to unite one another, to bring yourself back into the relationship. And so we see that sex is sticky and psychology would say it's actually a glue and your lives are stuck to one another. And this becomes one of the dangers of us jumping in and out of sexual relationships, maybe before the marriage bed is that stuff sticks and it stays and now it follows us into relationship. So I wanna show you a few things, just a handful of them, uh, in this place of when we talk about sex, some things that culture is missing and they're lobbing it up and painting it and portraying it in such a way, but they're really just myths. Let me give you three sex myths. This is one of the things that you'll hear within culture and particularly if you're, again, young, and you're in the classroom, or you're single, and you're dating again, this is one of just the trends. We have a very hookup type culture. And so one of the things that we are sold is that sex is just this physical thing. And so if it's just this physical thing, if it's, it's like an appetite. When I get hungry, I wanna eat. And when I wanna eat, it doesn't really matter what restaurant I go to as long as I get some food. We are sold this idea that sex is just this physical act and it's okay to have these one night stands. It's just the two of us. We're mature, consenting adults. We can do what we want with our body. And let me just ask you this, okay? Because I don't think you really believe this. Because if sex was only just physical, why is it that when adultery takes place, it's so hard to shake? If sex is really just this physical thing, then why do we get so upset if our partner goes to another marital bed? It's just physical. 
If sex is just physical, then why is it that when we're talking with people, more often than not, that their greatest pains, their greatest regret, they deal with sex? If it's just physical, why so much emotional baggage? If sex is just physical, why is it so difficult when a child who is sexually abused for them to ever recover from this? It's just physical. Somewhere along the way, we're being propagated this idea that your sexuality is just this physical thing and you do with it what you want. You do you, boo. Another thing that you need to see is that sex is so much more than just this physical act. Another myth that we see this way is is that your body is a commodity. Your body is a commodity. And come on, young ladies, I need you to hear this. Single ladies, I need you to hear this. There's this idea that you can, you can use what God has given you, your body, and you can leverage it for your gain. He'll love me if I sleep with him. He'll change if I just give him what he wants. Look, I'm not talking about this happens when you're like in your 20s and your 30s. I'm talking about I hear it in our youth group. These are the pressures being put upon young minds. And for you, if you are one of those young minds, you need to understand your body is not a commodity. Your body body has extreme value before the Lord. And we don't go around peddling ourselves, giving parts of our heart away. You're too valuable for that. Your body is not a commodity to be traded Young ladies fall into this trap way too often. If you love me, you'll give me what I want. (laughs) These are just myths. Your body is a commodity. (laughs) This next one we get from the Beatles. All you need is love. (laughs) This is about the most foolish idea and probably the one that I believed. I'm a romantic at the heart. I mean, man, all you need is love. (laughs) <laughs> That's baloney. <laughs> Be in relationship for more than an hour and you, feel, and you figure this part out. <laughs> Look, here's what lie you will tell yourself. We love each other. I know, I know, I know. God, I know what God's word probably says about that, but you, God will understand. See, we're gonna get married one day. We love each other. And all you need is love. And so when we begin to look at like God's design for these relationships and him giving us these boundaries, I, I need to give you some of these things to understand. How do, you, how do you take this away and what do you do with it? So how do we apply this, all right? And so here's what I want you to see. Here's how we're gonna do this, is how do we do it God's way? How do we do it God's way, all right? What does sex look like from God's design and what would that mean for me? All right, again, multiple context in the room here. Youth, single, married, okay? And so one of the first things that I want you to see is, depending on where you are, is to surrender your sexuality. How do we do it God's way? You need to surrender your sexuality. You need to realize, okay, God, you designed me these way, this way. You put these desires on the inside of my heart, and I need to surrender that to you. And so I want to say this. This is one of my favorite verses. If you are a parent, you're welcome to adopt this one. I share it with my kids often. Here's what it says. Daughters, I tell my son, son of Jerusalem, I charge you, do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires. I understand that these desires have been put inside of your heart. I understand that you like when people are interested in you and it's okay for you to date them, to like them, to hold hands with them. All of that is okay. What I'm trying to tell you is don't awaken love when you're not ready for it yet. When you think that it's just about being mature when it's really about being married. Do not make this mistake, my friend. One of the things that it will cost you is later down the road when you do enter into a marriage relationship and now you've given away parts of yourself to all of these other people, I promise you, I promise you, take my, take my advice, 
Regret will be there. I can't give this because I can't get it back because I gave it away to her and to her. And so if you're a youth in the room, man, come on. I know those hormones are raging within you. I know there are times when it's like, oh my goodness, did you see how pretty she was or how cute he was or, or we love each other? What I need you to do is just move past all of that and say, you know what? I'm gonna surrender my sexuality right here as a teen, right here as a dating individual. I'm gonna surrender. I'm gonna give this up to the Lord. I'm gonna surrender it to the Lord. We surrender our sexuality. And here's, here's what happens especially when you're in youth. You get this FOMO, fear of missing out. I'm just telling you, everybody on the school bus, everybody in the classroom, everybody on the sports team, they're all gonna be talking about who did what with whom. And you're gonna have a little bit of FOMO. Well, that sounds fun. That sounds pretty exciting. Here's what I want you to know. Giving up something now for something better later, it's not a sacrifice. It's an investment. You've got desires and longing, even if you're dating, you're in relationship with one another. Giving up something now, even something, maybe you're already doing it, but not God's way, and you're not in marriage relationship. Come into this position and say, you know what? We're gonna give up something now. We're gonna put something in place that protects us. Why? Because we know that we're making an investment into the future of this relationship. We're gonna do it God's way. We're going to surrender our sexuality. Let me give you a second one. And this is to establish boundaries. Establish boundaries. Now, if you're married, this isn't really for you. This is youth and singles. Establish boundaries. Look, here's what the word says to us. Above all else, do what? Above all else, guard your heart. Establish boundaries. Guard your heart. Can I say this to you? Look, if you wait when it's Saturday night and you're on the couch and you're watching popcorn and you got a movie on and you got the blanket over you and now your hands start to wander, if you wait until then, you missed it. You missed it. What you need to do is if you're in a dating relationship, if you wanna protect your purity, then you need to establish some boundaries. You need to have an upfront conversation that might seem a little bit awkward, and it might be like, hey, listen, I don't know about you, but for me, I value my sexuality in the way that God designed it, and I, I want you to understand some boundaries. For my wife and I, you know what led us into not having sex before marriage? Is we had boundaries. Relational things. I like to say they were my idea, but they weren't. <laughs> they weren't. She had relationship boundaries, and she communicated them with me. And because I valued her, well, they became my values too. What I'm trying to say to you is youth, dating, single, it's so important. Don't wait until the heat of the moment. Know what you're going to do before you get there. Put boundaries in place, establish those boundaries. Guard your heart. You jump in one bed to the next bed to the next bed and you won't have a lot of yourself left to give and you'll wish you did. Guard that part of your heart. Number three, pursue purity. Pursue purity, pursue purity. Here's what Paul begins to tell us is that God would create sex for intimacy designed to bring a husband and wife together, but it would not be long before there was all of these other perversions where people would move outside of God's established boundaries for relationship and people would just get with whoever, whenever they wanted to. And so for us, Paul begins to speak and he says, you should flee sexual immorality. You should flee sexual immorality. Oh, by the way, this isn't just intercourse. This is like all forms of fornication. This is like touching, heavy petting. This is all of the stuff. And Paul says to us very clearly that you, you should flee sexual immorality. Why? 
This is really interesting. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. He's saying that in many regards, so many other things that when I sin, I can sin against Travis and I can create offense that's over here, but he and I could talk and we could restore. There's something that happens with this kind of sexual sin at the soul level. It's on the inside of us. And we sin in sexual ways. It impacts us at soulish levels. And so he says, flee sexual immorality. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've received from God? You're not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Honor God with your bodies. Pursue purity. Pursue purity. Make that your goal. God, I want to honor you with my body. I want to honor you with my sexuality. Lord, I give this to you. I honor you. And then let me give you number four. I'm going to skip down here just a little bit. Let me give you number four, okay? And so here's the fourth one is do it often. Doing it God's way. Do it. Let, let me clarify. Not for youth <laughs> and not if you're in dating relationship. I, I want to show you this. If you're in marriage relationship, is your sexual relationship with each other was God's way of pointing you back at each other to bring each other into intimate relationship, to know each other, to be known, fully loved and valued, to be addicted to each other. If you're in married relationship and you've ever gone a period of time where there's a gap between the two of you, haven't been together in a minute, something happens immediately there's a drift, there's a gap. And Paul, God through Paul, gives us a very clear warning about if you're in marriage relationship, look, this is a gift from God and you should embrace that bad boy. Here's what he says. He says, do not deprive each other except perhaps by mutual consent. Do not deprive each other of sex. Do not withhold sex from each other except for mutual consent for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. And then do what? Yeah, do it often. Come together again and again. Do it often. Why? And this is, this is interesting, isn't it? Why do it often? Because why? Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Married folks, this is God's permission to you to do it often. This is the thing that brings you together, that unites you. It's God's gift to you for one another. Now, maybe in your relationship, sometimes it feels like, I don't know, things are a little cold. Maybe they've lost their passion, their zeal for one another. Look, sex is complicated even within the marriage relationship. It requires communication. It requires us leaning into each other and understanding. But what I want you to know, what I want you to hear is that in culture, we see that sex is pervasive, but we see it's, it's a perversion. But God gives us this great gift, but he guides us on what to do with it. And when we use it or abuse it, always, always ends up in a predictable pattern, pain and destruction, always. What would it look like for you if you were a youth and you would say, you know what, on this day, on Cinco de Mayo 2024, I said, you know what, God, I'm going to give you my sexuality and I'm going to surrender it. What if you, as a single, you decided, you know what, in my dating relationships, I'm going to pursue purity and I'm going to establish some boundaries. And maybe if we've gone there, we're not going to go there any longer. Why? Because we're going to honor the Lord and his design for our relationship. Why? Well, because ultimately, that's how you see your own relationship goals fulfilled. Why would you shortchange yourself? Why would you cheat yourself by giving parts of yourself away today when you know what you'll want to give tomorrow. Now, married folks, this design, what if you just invited God into it? I know that's a little bit strange. What if you said, God, we give you our sexuality and our relationship. Unite us together. Make us one. Strengthen our relationship through this. I believe that God blesses that kind of sex. Amen? 
All right, I want to pray for you. I know it's a little bit of a different Sunday, and some of you are like, I came here on Baptism Sunday, and dude's talking about sex. <laughs> Look, this is so, so important on how we engage in our relationships. I hope you'll apply this and watch the difference that it makes. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I thank you for everyone under the sound of my voice, for the youth and those who are in dating relationships, those who are married. God, you know right where they are in their journey and help them to navigate these desires that are on the inside, to know what to do with them. God, that we all might make the decision to honor you with our sexuality. God, and I just pray for our youth, and I just pray for just protection. Protect their minds, God. Protect their hearts. I pray for those who are in dating relationships that you would protect them, God. And God, for our marriages, that you might strengthen them through our union. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.